Okay, here's where we're at. Last time we talked about taking an aldehyde and a ketone and adding to it an alcohol using acid as a catalyst and that left us with adding the OR and turning the carbonyl into an OH. So this um, was a hemi, in this specific case, this is a hemi acetal. Now, I put homework or take home quiz problems in the folders for today, and it's due on Monday, and the last section of that is to identify from different molecules whether they're hemiacetals, hemiketals, acetals, ketals, hydrates, etc. And so how would you do that? What you want to do is you want to find the carbon that has the two oxygens attached to it. And when you do that, you're going to have a couple of choices for those oxygen groups. Are they both OHs? It's a hydrate. If it's an OH and an OR, it's a hemi something. If it's two ORs, it's something of the hemi. So that's that's what you have to do. You just have to find the carbon with the two O's. So in this case, how do I know this is a hemi? Because it's OHOR. How do I know it's an acetal? I look at the other two groups. And with the other two groups, there will always be an R group and then the other groups. So if it's two R's, it came from a ketone. If it's two H's, it came from formaldehyde. If it is an R and an H, it came from an aldehyde. So in this case, this is a hemiacetal because it's got an OH, OR, R, and then the H, meaning it came from an aldehyde. So that was our first compound that we made. We could, if we wanted to, switch alcohols in midstream and say, okay, let me go ahead and add like R double prime OH, and that's going to give me then OR and OR double prime. So we can add the same alcohol, we can add two different alcohols for this. This is the full blown now acetal. And if the H was an alkyl group, it would be a full blown ketal. So we talked about the mechanism for that last time, which you have to do on those problems. Where does the equilibrium lie for this system? Remember for hydrates, for most compounds, when we form a hydrate, the equilibrium lies on the reactants. Only under certain circumstances can I push the equilibrium for a hydrate to form the hydrate. But run-of-the-mill aldehydes and ketones don't form very much hydrate. Same thing's true for aldehydes and ketones with alcohols most of the equilibrium is going to lie to the left. Unless I make a cyclic product. And if I make a cyclic product, the equilibrium will lie 100% to the right. So that's what we're going to start with. How do you make a cyclic acetal or a cyclic ketal? And the first question is, you know, how do I make it cyclic? All I have to do is link the two OHs that I'm going to add to the same molecule. So in this case, I could have OH, CH2, CH2OH, and this is called ethylene glycol. If I had three carbons there, I would have propylene glycol. Um, ethylene glycol is antifreeze. It's what's in your antifreeze. Um, and so with the two OHs, it changes the boiling point of the water in your, in your radiator to keep it from freezing in the winter and from boiling over in the summer. That's what the ethylene glycol is there for. How much? I don't know. Take it to the mechanic. And then you use one of those little 
um, things they dip in, they pull it up, so many balls float, and it tells you like what your percentage of ethylene glycol is. But nobody ever does that. You just take the mechanic and let them fill it. Um, ethylene glycol, or you could use propylene glycol. I think you'll see both kinds of problems. So this is one of these situations, just as an aside, where one carbon makes a huge difference. Ethylene glycol itself is poisonous. Um, nobody really sits down and drinks ethylene glycol. Uh, however, if you're out changing your radiator in your driveway in front of your house, if you spill it on the cement and you leave it sit there, then animals come by. They think it's really tasty because it's sweet, and then they die. So you, so you want to make sure that if you're using ethylene glycol, you keep you wipe it up when you're done. Just that's what happens. Um, propylene glycol is what's called environmentally friendly glycol because it doesn't it's not as poisonous so it, but it has a totally different density and making sure you got the right mix in your radiator is different so we use ethylene glycol that's probably its number one industrial use but it's also used to create cyclic acetals and cyclic ketals so here's what I'm going to do with my ethylene glycol I'm going to react it with acid as the catalyst. So the first step is going to be protonate the oxygen, the oxygen of the carbonyl. So I'm going to protonate the oxygen on the carbonyl to form that oxonium ion. And then I'm going to add one of the OHs attached to the ethylene glycol, it doesn't matter which one, because eventually I'm going to add both of them. So that comes in, and then that pair of electrons goes up to the oxygen. So I'm going to make the oxonium ion, because remember the entire alcohol adds. So that would be, with the plus charge on the oxygen, my first intermediate. And then what happens next? I'm going to lose the H plus. And the electrons are going to go to that oxygen, so now made my hemi acetal. I'm going to lose an H+. Plus. So in all these mechanisms, proton goes off, on, proton comes off. <coughs> okay, so there's my hemi acetal. Uh, then next step is it's going to react with the acid. And what am I going to do here? Somebody say it. Which oxygen? What? I could do either. If I protonate the oxygen of the um, alcohol, I just added I'm going backwards. So I want to go forwards, so I should probably protonate the OH. So there's my oxonium ion. Next step, lose the water. Water leaves its leaving group, and now I'm at <coughs> this oxonium ion. Go 
question? Okay. All right, so now what's going to happen is the other OH is going to wrap around the molecule and add to the carbocation. And what I'm going to make is a 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5 membered ring. So if I know that ahead of time, it kind of makes things a little bit easier because I'm going to have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 membered ring with now the oxygens attached to the carbon and the oxygen that's just added is going to have a positive charge on it. Is this um in what aspect? It, it isn't, well, tautomerization is when we move hydrogens and lone pairs around. So it doesn't quite fit that. Um, so really all we're doing is we're just, it's, it's a lot like SN1. It's a lot like SN1 reactions. So then my final step is going to be lose the H plus and then I make blush you, then I make my cyclic acetal. So this is a common way to make a cyclic acetal, and <coughs> we're going to talk about that being a, a method of protecting a carbonyl. Another method of protection like we talked about with silyl ethers. But this then is stable enough so that I could make this acetal, I could recrystallize it, I could probably um, purified by column chromatography, it's a stable molecule. And it's stable to everything. It's stable to all the reagents except one. It's stable to everything except H plus H2O. Because if I add H plus H2O to this, this whole system goes backwards to the aldehyde. And I'll show you that in a minute because basically this is a way to protect a ketone and as long as I don't use acidic reagents, it'll be okay. When I want the ketone or aldehyde back, I need to add H plus H2O. And an excess of H2O, so by Le Chatelier's principle, I can push everything backwards. Right, so that's the mechanism for forming a cyclic, for forming the, cy the cyclic acetal. Notice, I'm, notice the amount of it, uh, transition states that we're doing now is really being cut down because the mechanisms are getting a little bit longer. So there's no, I wouldn't ask you to do transition states for this, although you could if you wanted to. All right, so that's, that's how we make the cyclic acetal, and this is one of the compounds where the equilibrium is to the right. Now let's talk a little bit about OH.
Okay, so you didn't miss anything because those were the blank slides. Okay, so now where, where does this become important in um, like biochemistry or biology where you might have seen this before except I doubt you talked about the compounds as a cyclic hemiacetal or a cyclic acetal. And that is in the area of sugar, sugar chemistry. So here's a whole list of aldol trioses, tetroses, pentoses, hexoses. There's also some keto pentoses and stuff like that in there. That's just the terminology that um, I guess we used to use for describing all of the different open-chained um, sugars. So you can see that they're all open chain in this case, but what happens is if we take something like glucose, glucose has an open chain or linear form, and what will happen is, is that this OH group on the glucose will come up and will form a cyclic hemiacetal with that top aldehyde, basically closing up the ring to make the alpha D glucopyranose. So the pyranose is the cyclic form, and then um, the glucose is the open chain form. Now, why is this important? Well, in water, these open chain, um, the open chain form is a really minuscule amount. Most of these systems form the cyclic rings when they're in water. So you've probably seen the structure of glucopyranose, but nobody's ever called said, oh, that's a cyclic hemiacetal. And it is, because here's the carbon with the two O's on it. I got an OR and an OH, so it's a hemi. And then I got a carbon and an H group, so it's an acetal. <coughs> of course, it's written in these these um, planar structures, and we know that's not the case. We know it's in a cyclohexane chair. But we're not going to complicate the issue. What I'm showing you is that that's how these systems will cyclize, is by forming hemiacetals. There are also, uh, there's also fructose. Um, I think fructose is evil, right? High fructose corn syrup will kill you. Um, eventually. But the difference between fructose and glucose is that fructose is a ketone. And so this OH group will come in and add to the carbonyl so that now when we close the five-membered ring, we end up with the carbon with two O8, the two O's on it. It's still a hemi, but now it's got these two carbons on it. And so it's a hemi um, ketone. And if you put glucose and fructose together, you make what? Sucrose. So fructose and fructose and glucose together, the six and the five membered rings bonded together so that they're an ether is uh, sucrose. Okay, these are all optically active, although the D doesn't necessarily mean that it's dextrorotary, because you'll learn in biochemistry that when the D is when it in like this position, when the OH is on the right hand side of this basically um, Fisher projection that it's D. So D may or may not have anything to do with its optical rotation. Because biochemists do things a little differently. And I can teach you organic, not so much biochem. You could take somebody else for that. Um, but you may have seen these. So when you talk about glucose then, glucose is less than 1% in solution, and it's 99% in one of two possible forms. The OH and the H can basically be reversed or inverted. 
So that would make these two molecules diastereomers. I didn't even think about this. So in your book, they talk about what's called the anomeric effect. And I may come back to the anomeric effect and talk a little bit more about it. But depending on whether the H or the OH is in the top position, um, when the H is in the top position, it's alpha. When it's in the lower position, it's beta. Or you can look at the OH um, oppositely. Anomeric effect means that these two sugars would actually react somewhat differently. But the light bulb just went off in my head for the first time. That, well, no blank. Of course they'll react differently because... They're two diastereomers. And we learned back last semester that diastereomers are different compounds. So they should react differently. Because everything else is the same. It's only that carbon that gets inverted. So the anomeric effect is important in sugar chemistry because one of these two forms can react, one of them won't. And so there's just by changing that chiral center, you can change the reactivity of the molecule. But again, they're diastereomers, so that's not that surprising. And I, be honest, I haven't quite, I haven't looked to see what they talked about with the anomeric effect in top hat, because nobody ever puts that in the book at this point. Um, so we'll come back, we'll come back and take a look at that. But that's what happens when you cyclize these. And of course, when you cyclize these, you can put those, ring, those sugar rings together to make cellulose. And all the cellulose is, is it's an ether linkage between those sugars. <coughs> and so if you have a five-membered glucose, or five-membered fructose, six-membered <coughs> glucose, that's the linkage that happens with sucrose. And if you go on, take PCHEM lab, um, if you measured the optical rotation of the two molecules together, it has one sign of a rotation. And if you add acid to that, as this ether gets protonated and then breaks apart, so it's ether cleavage from last exam. Do we have that on the last exam? Oh, we might have to have it on the next exam. So when we have ether cleavage, then we actually make two molecules with two different distinctively different optical rotations and so you can when you hydrolyze the sugar you can actually see its sign of its rotation it changes and that's a kinetics experiment that they do in PCHEM lab and that's how you can tell if you have a food product that has high corn high or corn, high fructose corn syrup is because it will have a, a different rotation if you were to take the sugars out of it than if it was just simply glucose or fructose together versus separately. And high fructose corn syrup is apparently not good. Although it's not. And so that's cyclic, that's where the cyclic acetals come into play in your biology and your biochemistry class. Now, protection. We've talked previously about taking an alcohol. If we want to protect it from reacting, we would take that and react it with the trimethylsilyl chloride. And that would put the trimethylsilyl group on the oxygen and now all of a sudden it doesn't react. OHs would normally be oxidizable. This one isn't. Then when I'm done, I take fluoride and the fluoride strips the silyl group off to then deprotect and form my alcohol. So this was the protection part. 
and this is the D protection. So the idea here is that I have multiple functional groups in a molecule. I want to do something to one, to one functional group, but I don't want to touch the other. And so that's where protection comes into play. What, one of the ways that cyclic acetals and ketals are used is in that sort of a protection scheme. So let's say I had this alkyl halide that has a ketone in it. And I wanted to react this alkyl halide with magnesium followed by carbon dioxide followed by H plus and H2O. Because I want to add a carboxylic acid group on the end where the bromine is. And so I would make the Grignard, react it with CO2, so that the final product that I would expect would now have the carboxylic acid group on the end. So if I sat down and said, you know, I want to make this molecule, I think I'll just do a Grignard CO2 acid and water. You know, if there's a boss involved, you'd go say, hey, how's this look? And they fire you. Or ridicule you, or because they said that, that, that's not going to work. And why isn't it going to work? Grenier, well, I'm going to add the H plus H2O at the end. So we've already said the Grignards can't have to be made in the absence of anything that's, that's um, deprotonatable. Water, alcohol, amines, carboxylic acids. <coughs> but what else can they not be made in the presence of? something else, well, no, something else that they will react with. So if I made this Grignard, if I made this Grignard, what would happen? Well, that's, this C- minus is going to react with what? How about the ketone group? That Grignard would react with the ketone group. Now you said it would make a ring, maybe. Here's here's what here's what we have to constantly sort of remind ourselves about these reactions that we're doing. When we do a reaction, it's almost like it's one individual molecule reacting with another individual molecule, but really it's a bazillion molecules, and that's not a real word, but I don't care reacting with another bazillion molecules. So actually this might form a ring or it might just react with another molecule with a carbonyl group on it. But either way, the Grignard is not going to be there when I add the CO2. It will have reacted with the carbonyl. So it's going to react with that. So what do I need to do? Protect it protect it from reaction. So if I want to do this reaction, I would say, okay, let's go ahead and protect that ketone. With using ethylene glycol. So I would add H plus and ethylene glycol to make the, in this case, a ketal. So then I would go ahead and add my magnesium and I would make, I'm still protected, and I would make my Grignard. Now, is the Grignard going to react with the acetal?
<coughs> so they give me an answer. No. Do we agree with no? It will not react with the acetal. Anybody have the question why? Anybody have the answer to the question why? <clears throat> and H plus. The acetal will only react with H plus and H2O. It's stable to all other reagents. You must have read the book ahead of time. I just said it five minutes ago. Right? It's stable. It doesn't react with anything but H plus H2O. So it's stable with Grignard's. It's stable with sodium borohydride. It's stable with lithium aluminum hydride. It's stable with anything that's not H plus H2O. So I'd make my Grignard. I would go ahead and add CO2. And now I would, again, my ketone is still protected and I end up making the carboxylate because I haven't added the H plus H2O yet. So I go ahead and add the CO2 and now I've made my carboxylate and then whenever I do a Grignard there's always that then H plus H2O step. So now this then H plus H2O step is going to do two things. It's going to protonate the carboxylic acid, but it's also going to take the ketal and reverse it all the way back to the beginning. somebody asked this morning they said well would you use like two equivalents of H plus H2O and so then I did the unthinkable which is relate lecture to lab because we can't break down that wall and said well actually we never figure out how much acid to add because what do we do we add a little bit of acid we stir it around we test it with pH paper. And so we keep adding acid until <coughs> the solution is acidic and the solution will become acidic after it's protonated the COOH and after it's taken the acetal all the way back to the ketone. Or you could just dump in a ton of it, either way. So this is protection. It's a different kind of protection. It is protection with protection of ketones, but since this is actually the second time we've seen protection, it's the same overall procedure. And that's the important part of, the more important part of making cyclic acetals as ketals, is because they're most often done as protecting groups, although they are done in biochemistry, sugars do those naturally. And there's a third way that we can protect or a third way of looking at protection, and that is going back to sugar chemistry. So if I just draw some generic sugar, I know there's always like a CO2 OH group hanging off of it. Um, I've got the oxygen there in the ring. There was a time back in starting probably in the, well when I first heard about it back 
I guess in the eighties and the late seventies. You, I know none of none of you were born yet. I got it, but I was, and I remember gas lines in the seventies when you could had to, you could only get gas if your license plate was odd or even on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, because we had the oil oil embargo, and so people that was our first sort of energy crisis was what happens if we don't have any more oil. And people started to think about, well, what kinds of other renewable alternatives do we have to oil? And one of them that came up was sugar. Could we make stuff out of sugar? Could we make fuel out of sugar? Could we make plastics out of sugar? And sure, we could do that. I mean, ethanol cars come from sugar. Right? We ferment the sugar to make ethanol. And that's great, not what I'm really after. Sugar chemistry is also used in making pharmaceuticals. And so if you want to do something with sugar, we have a problem. I usually want to add something to one of these five oxygens, and they're all the same. So how do I differentiate between each oxygen if I want to add something to the sugar? Now, I'm, I'm going to come really close to performing biochemistry malpractice here because I'm not qualified to discuss much of biochemistry, having one semester of general bio, second semester senior year. At the same time, I was taking uh, biochemistry. I took them both at the same time. Freshman in the class, bad. Bad, bad combination, senior chemistry major taking biochemistry and freshman bio no curve then there shouldn't have been a curve so they that wasn't very popular that just didn't add to it so when we're talking about biochemistry again I will oftentimes say I know this much biology and chemistry my fingers are really close together they're not quite touching and sometimes I'll sandbag you because I know a little bit more than that but if you're going to do drug discovery you got to get the drug inside the cell, right? How do you do that? Sometimes you attach the drug to something that the cell wall will say, okay, come on in, and then it drags the drug in with it. Sugars are great at that. So for some drugs, you want to attach the drug to the sugar because it'll get it inside the cell where it's going to do whatever it's going to do. Right. Well, again, if I'm going to sit down and synthesize adding this drug to the sugar, I got four OH groups that are similar, and maybe the C2OH is a little bit different. So in, when you do sugar chemistry, you do a lot of protection and deprotection. To keep this OH from reacting, but react these other two, then remove the protection, then react the other one. So sometimes in sugar synthesis, they spend more time protecting, deprotecting the OH groups than they do adding stuff. It's just the nature of sugar chemistry. And how that relates to the beginning is if I wanted to make a fuel or a plastic or something like that from sugar, I got to think about the same issue. So here's one of the ways that you can think about that. And that is, let's just say I had this molecule where those two OHs were um, bold, so they were cis, <coughs> and the other two OHs were dashed. So I would like to protect the two OHs that are cis. I'm going to use my protection that I just did, only I'm going to think about it in reverse. So in other words, I want to protect the two OHs, so I'm going to add to that a ketone that will now react with those two OHs like they were ethylene glycol to make a five member ring. But they will only, it will only react with two OHs that are cis and you gotta go all the way back to last semester to talk about five membered rings. If you remember from last semester, if we tried to take CAMINO4 and add it to a double bond, 
you had to make the five-membered ring and it had to be cis because a five-membered ring isn't big enough to stretch from the top to the bottom of like a cyclohexane ring. And so the same thing is true here. That ketone will only react with two OHs that are cis. So if I do that by adding H+, plus, I'm now going to protect the two OHs that are cis as a ketal. <coughs> and so what I've now done is I've now opened up the other two OHs for me to react. And then when I want to react the two cis OH groups, maybe I'll then add H plus H2O, deprotect them, and go ahead and do what I need to do. Is that an X or is that a con? That is the shorthand way of writing acetone like that. Because most often you'll see it as the as kind of the X. So that's a C with a CH with two CH threes. Let's see if I can erase that and that. So there are ways of differentiating the OH groups and sugars in order to add things, and you have to do a lot of protection and deprotection. You could think, okay, silyl ethers we could use, we could use this, we could use, there are things called mom groups, methoxy, methyl ethers, I believe. So there's a lot of these different ways to protect, but if you're going to do sugar chemistry, which I do, if I got to go two steps in a synthesis, I'm I'm out. I want I like one step syntheses where I just order it directly. Um, but if you're going to do that, and a lot of people are involved in taking carbohydrates and trying to add drug molecules to them, protection is huge. But this way, what we did was we just kind of reversed it. We're protecting the glycol instead of protecting the ketone. So <coughs> that's another way of, of um, looking at these acetals and ketals as protecting groups. <coughs> and since we're getting closer and closer to the end of this class, then you know we have to begin I have to begin to sort of say, okay, this is what the real these are what the real applications would be. Not that the other ones aren't, but this is sort of a glimpse into if you were going to go out and be a synthetic chemist, you need to, these are all the different reactions you would learn. Okay, in my last few minutes, let's add, let's do the last reaction of a carbonyl with, an, with a group, well not the last one, but the last one for today, and that is this reaction. I could form a cyanohydrin. So what we do with a cyanohydrin is we add cyanide, net hydrogen cyanide, but the problem with hydrogen cyanide itself is it's a gas, it will kill you, um, and so we can't just dump in HCN to an aldehyde or ketone. Instead what we do is we take cyanide, it's still pretty dangerous stuff, but not instantly killable. And we react that with that, with the carbonyl to now form the, it's not really an alkoxide, but with the O minus, and then we add the H plus. So most places it'll talk about adding CN minus, then H plus. Um, I've abbreviated as HCN, but it's really not HCN, because HCN is a gas. And, um, so we can't really do the reaction that way. But we make this molecule called a cyanohydrin. A cyanohydrin has a couple of a couple of uses. I haven't looked in the book yet to see if the bug is there, but every organic book that talks about making a cyanohydrin has a picture of the same bug. And it's a bug that's being trying to, somebody's trying to eat it. And so what it does is it carries around HCN. 
but it carries around it around as a cyanohydrin. So it can reverse this process and spray HCN on whatever's trying to eat it. And then that annoys it and it leaves it alone. So it pretty much has prepackaged HCN and if somebody's trying if some other bug's trying to eat it, it locks and loads and sprays it with HCN. Every single organic book has a picture of that of that bug. <sighs> Important for the bug. Where else does this come into play? Well, on Monday, I and I know I did this, so you have to go back and look at your notes. But a nitrile functional group is classified as a carboxylic acid derivative. What does it mean to be a carboxylic acid derivative? It means when you add H plus H2O, you become a carboxylic acid. So if you make this cyanohydrin, then you're not the bug, you can add H plus H2O to it and make what's called an alpha hydroxy carboxylic acid, or, an, or a hydroxy acid or an alpha hydroxy acid. Those have a little different use. Um, they are used primarily in like moisturizers, skin creams, because they have the ability to um, trap water. And so if you have a uh, hand cream and you look at it, chances are you'll see an alpha hydroxy carboxylic acid of some sort in it. And while personal care products will not, you know, cure cancer, they are a big area of chemistry that people um, that people study and are much more complicated than they appear on the shampoos are incredibly complicated because the polymer chemistry that goes into shampoos is like classes they teach and different places where they do that they have to worry about that so for the bug the cyanohydrin is great for us we take that and form an alpha hydroxy carboxylic acid all right, on Wednesday, we will start with talking about what happens when I add nitrogen based compounds to carbonyls. All right, so those problems are due on Monday. If you have any questions on those, uh, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we'll continue on Friday.